Welcome to City Council Special Budget Work Session, Tuesday, May 17th, 2022. We'll begin with the roll call. Council Member Babcock. Present. Council Member Brookover. Here. Council Member Watson. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Greg. Here. Mayor Bacon. Present. I look for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Moved. Look for a second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Any communication from council members? Councilperson Brookover? Oh, thank you, sir. Councilperson Babcock? Uh, at the later meeting. Councilperson Watson? Pass. Mayor Pro Tem Greg? Nothing at this time. Pass. Next up, item 4.1, discussion of fiscal year 2023, preliminary budget with emphasis on Parks and Recreation Fund and the Parks Capital Improvement Fund. So I can just start off, Mayor and Council. Um, obviously, tonight is our fifth and final planned work session for the budget. Appreciate Council's great patience and participation in that, um, and staff also being here to answer questions. Tonight, we have the budget for Parks and Recreation Fund and Parks Capital Improvement Fund. And then we should leave time at the end of this meeting for further discussion from the budget about the budget from council, further questions. So we think that this presentation will take 40 minutes perhaps with questions. And then we have plenty of time for council to have any final questions asked or if you want to propose any changes that we can put in the book for next week for the resolution, it would certainly be an excellent time for that. So with that, I can turn it over to Kathy DeChambeau to start the presentation. Thank you, George. Good afternoon, Mayor Bacon, Mayor Pro Tem Greg, and council members. I am so excited to be here with you this afternoon um, for my first time through the Parks and Rec budget officially. Uh, we have lots to talk about, and I want to leave plenty of time for you to ask questions either during the presentation or after. To give you reference, we are looking at page 90 of the Parks and Recreation Fund, um, or it starts on page 90, and the Park CIP in your book starts on page 150. Um, so I'm just gonna get started. I think uh, these pictures say a lot about all the <laughs> fun and um, interesting things that go on in the Parks and Recreation and Arts Department. So to give you an idea of where we're going, I'm gonna talk a little bit or a lot about us. Uh, DEI initiatives that we are either undergoing or plan to uh, take on, goals and objectives, parks and recreation, uh, our fiscal year 23 budget request, our proposed fee schedule, our capital improvement program, and then questions. So I wanted to start a little bit with about us. Um, one thing that I think is really unique about our department is that we're both human services and infrastructure. So you've had presentations on infrastructure, a wonderful presentation on sewer and all of, all of the roads and all the infrastructure, but we do inf infrastructure too. And so I wanna talk about that. And I wanna talk about how we do human services. That's a really important part of what we do and I want to give you lots of detail about what we do. So the Department of Parks and Recreation encourages active and healthy and creative environmentally friendly lifestyles. Um, if you haven't seen the cover of our new Connect magazine that came out with all of our summer offerings, um, I think it's one of our best covers ever. It's really uh, exciting and um, we really appreciate that Mayor Bacon was game to be part of our photo shoot. Uh, he, was, he was really great about it. So in a typical year, we can surpass attendance of nearly a million people coming through our facilities, coming to our programs, uh, using our outdoor facilities and our indoor facilities. And of course, we offer a wide range of activities, um, whether you're here at the East Lansing Hanna Community Center, our soccer complex, our softball complex, our aquatic center, community parks, um, neighborhood parks, I think we have 30 parks in total, about 5.8 miles of uh, trail, and in addition, we have our popular school age programs at the elementary schools and that are also held here at the Hanna Community Center. Just to give you a little detail of 
all of the different programs that fall under our various uh, divisions, aquatics, you know, really uh, runs the span of everything from pop parent and child lessons, learn to swim, private swim lessons, master swim, um, senior aerobics, we do pool rentals, lap swim. Uh, East Lansing Family Aquatic Center, of course, has been closed for two years, and we are working to open the summer for the first time in two years, and that is a huge operation. Uh, under dance, we have lots of offerings, art and ceramics. Um, the picture is from actually a grandparent and me clay class, which I love. So when you look at these programs, you can see we just run the span of ages, abilities, interests, um, lots of things that are that are good for the body and good for the soul. Um, our school age care program, uh, it has both the BNA program that runs through all six of the East Lansing Public School elementary schools. We also do break care, which means on winter breaks, spring breaks, we have uh, care for children here at the Hannah Community Center. And we also have our kids summer camp. We have performing art here, we have fitness, we have um, a variety of sports programs from camps to buddy basketball to um, all the recreation sports and then we also run the middle school sports program for the schools and so that consists of girls and boys basketball uh, we have um, volleyball cross country and track and field and then of course we have our community events the farmers market play in the park um, we also have the Crystal Awards, which aren't actually listed on here, but I know are coming up soon and, and that you're familiar with. So I um, wanted to go on to give you an idea of what our, our uh, team looks like, our leadership team. So um, we have myself, our assistant director, Wendy Wilmers Longpre, who is here in attendance tonight, um, Jane Stone, our administrative services coordinator. I um, just want to say that Jane was an amazing and is always an amazing um, help with these kinds of efforts. And so I really appreciate the time and effort that she put into this. Um, Jim Jennings, of course, is our projects and aquatics coordinator. And he is um, very busy right now putting together the staff and all of the rest of the construction out at the aquatic center and wrapping that up for us. Um, Justin Dwanke is another administrative services coordinator who's also in charge of the Jazz Festival and community events and CIP. Lois Fogersi is um, our guest services coordinator here at HANA, and uh, Jennifer Wyatt is our events coordinator. Kathleen Miller is the rec and arts coordinator. Tim Lane is our athletic specialist. He is also uh, he also helps with the art festival, and he is. Um, working on that this week, along with Heather Mahano, who's our art festival coordinator, Julianne Jennings, who's our child care coordinator, Carlos Barajas, who's our facilities coordinator. One of our newer staff is Dana Caponin. She's our aquatic specialist. And Carla Forrest Hewitt is our community event specialist. We also have a theater technician, Lucas uh, Lalonde, because we obviously have a lot of theater use with all of us Children's Express and rentals. Um, and then we have Liz Cook, who's uh, the theater leader, Bethany Ross and Brandon Friday, our child care specialist, and Chen Pham is our facilities technician. But that's not all. <laughs> this is all of our contingent staff. Um, I think that that's a really big part of our story in Parks and Rec, is that we have so many folks that are needed to put on the programs and to um, provide the services that we provide in the community. And I think that that sometimes missed sort of the sheer number of, of people. Um, it can range from 130 to 150 when we're fully staffed in the aquatic center. So that's a, that's a lot of folks to hire. It's a lot of folks to manage. It's a lot of folks to train. Um, and I want to just kind of keep that in the forefront as we go through this, this um, presentation. So I'd like to move on to DEI initiatives, goals, and objectives. And I want to start with some of the DEI initiatives that um, we've been working on over the course of the last uh, six to eight months or so. Um, one thing that I think is, is a little bit unique about our department and something that 
I know I'm really proud of our staff for engaging in and for completing uh, 77 parks and recreation staff have become certified in mental health first aid which is a really great program if you're not familiar with it. It's a three-year national certification. Um, we provided them the all-day course through Wayne State University, some really amazing facilitators through Wayne State University. And they have two, two different certifications. There's an adult mental health first aid, and there's a youth mental health first aid. And we had people um, take the certification that best aligned with the work that they do and the folks that they work with. But we also had a number of staff who were uh, certified in both, took both trainings. And so um, it was a great training. We're really pleased to have done that. And we think that having that knowledge and, and um, understanding helps our staff in working with the public, reducing barriers and stigma and to being very helpful in all the needs of all the people that come through our programs and come through our buildings and, and um, participate in, in Parks and Rec. Um, I think that all of us could say that the two years of the pandemic have taken a toll in, in some way, um, either as staff or as people dealing with the public or just as individual humans. And so I think it was really helpful to take the time and to have this, um, this focused training so that they can both take care of themselves and they can take care of others. And that was just something that was really important to me. Um, I, I heard Councilmember Watson, I believe, ask the police chief about Narcan training when he was up here. And um, I wanted to raise my hand and say, we did that. <laughs> we did do that. So this last fall, we considered that a, a priority and we had Ingham County come in. And so 24 of our staff received Narcan training and Narcan kits. And so we have that available um, throughout Hannah, um, our staff at City Hall that is housed there as well, um, and staff at various other sites have that available. So again, it was something that um, we considered important and invaluable. Our proposed fiscal year 2023 fee schedule um, eliminates the resident, non-resident fee structure for all adult youth pro for all youth programming, not adult programming. And I just, I will talk about that more in the fee schedule, but I also wanted to talk about it as part of our DEI initiatives. Um, a lot of our, myself along with our staff, really felt strongly about this. Um, when you, when you're at the front desk and you see a group of youth come in and they're all friends from school, East Lansing High School, and they're coming here to play basketball, and one of the kids or two of the kids is paying a different rate than the other kids because they're schools of choice, um, because they're not residents of East Lansing, to do the same activity with their friends who are paying a lower rate didn't seem right. We looked at what that would cost in terms of our revenue, and I can talk about that more in the fee schedule, but we really felt that that was um, a barrier. While someone might have that extra dollar or two that we were charging for the non-resident, I felt like the, the hit that it takes to somebody's um, self-esteem potentially is not worth that extra dollar or two. And I, and I think that this was a, a welcome uh, change in discussion that I think staff had been looking for for a while. So um, we'll talk about that more as we, as we get into the fee schedule. As you know, we received a Michigan Department of Education Child Care Stabilization Grant this year, and that we put the focus of that grant on uh, reimbursing tuition payments to our, our families that participate in child care. Um, we have more relief coming. Uh, we believe that we will be successful in the second round of grant funding, and we intend to also use that grant funding to help provide relief um, so when you see later in the discussion that we are um, increasing tuition fees for our child, um, our school age programs, that will be offset by that grant at least through this year. So we can talk about that more there. Some of the other things we're doing is we've put funding in our budget for um, creating signage and language, languages additional to English at our public facilities. 
Um, I believe you know that we have created all gender restrooms and changing rooms um, here at the Hanna Community Center. We have two, Patriarch Park, and um, we will also have uh, two operational at the Aquatic Center when it opens. Um, we are providing free menstrual products in all men's and women's restrooms throughout the city now. Um, I believe we may only have a couple more to go to install and um, the, the entire city will be covered. Um, and we are actively recruiting for seasonal employment through a variety of, of sort of more non-traditional methods, really trying to be very inclusive and expand the diversity of our staff and um, our outreach efforts. So that's something that we have been working on. Uh, you may or may not know this, but um, Carla Forrest Hewitt, who's our farmer's market manager who popped in just a, a bit ago, um, has been actively recruiting BIPOC vendors for the farmer's market um, and has been soliciting sponsorship for the Power of Produce Club to provide vouchers for the purchase of fruits and vegetables to ch for children. I don't know if you know about this program, but it provides a $3 voucher and um, some additional funding so that we can provide education through the farmer's market so that children can have access to very healthy um, food and very healthy uh, eating habits in order to um, stem the concerns for uh, diet-related disease later in life. And so this is something that we would extend. Um, we participated previously. We had a sponsor sponsorship last year. We're still pursuing one for this year. Um, this year, the intention is to raise the age limit. So it was, uh, I think, limited at 15 last year, and we would like to take it to 18 this year. So um, something that we're trying to grow and, and uh, keep going. In terms of goals and objectives, these are all goals and objectives that our staff worked on early last year, starting, I believe, towards the end of September in our staff meetings. We started brainstorming about strategic priorities, knowing that we would have some new strategic priorities adopted by City Council and, and really looking at what our goals and objectives should be for the coming um, several years and how we wanted to um, organize ourselves. And so, um, Essentially, we, we want to implement best practices of inclusive, welcoming communities um, to ensure inclusion of people of all backgrounds, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic position, or physical cognitive ability, including but not limited to inclusive restroom signage, signage in multiple language, improved accessibility within playgrounds, and options for inclusions that accommodate user needs to the greatest extent possible. Um, wanted to give you an example of one of the things that um, Carla Forrest Hewitt, again, was working on um, over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, she, through the Farmers Market Coalition, was working with a, a group of farmers market managers on the anti-racist farmers market toolkit. And that was just published um, in the last couple of months. We're really excited about that. We're really excited about her involvement in that. And we are very excited to um, start implementing the, the suggestions and the tools in that toolkit in our own farmer's market. We really want to increase efforts to recruit and retain a workforce that's representative of the city's uh, diverse community through outreach, uh, resources, all, all kinds of, of ways of looking at retention and looking for a diverse workforce. Accessible playground, park, open space, and access for underserved areas is really important to us. And upgrading and improving existing areas where needed is very important to us. I can think of two areas that you will hear us talk about and have heard us talk about um, that fall into these two categories. One is Stoddard Park and one is Emerson Park. Both of those parks uh, need attention and they both fall within a, a um, a CDBG census track and um, they they really um, could use the the attention that that they deserve to be the public spaces and park spaces that those areas deserve we want to remove barriers to participation by actively promoting scholarship opportunities thoroughly 
We have had scholarship opportunities for many years. Um, those are available, but we suspect that maybe not everyone knows about those. We really want to make sure that people do know about them and avail themselves of those opportunities. One thing I'll mention is that we request CDBG funds for scholarships, but those CDBG funds for scholarships can only be used for East Lansing students, residents. They can't be used for those folks that we've talked about who are non-residents, maybe schools of choice. We're committed to providing those same level of scholarship funding um, for those people who don't qualify for those CDBG funds, but we may come to you to ask for some help to find those, that, fund, that funding, depending on how many people choose to uh, go that route. We have worked on revising language and job postings so that we're leading with equity so people know that, that we're leading with inclusiveness, and we've removed language that we thought potentially could create barriers to employment interest. We are interested in extending outdoor gathering and programming experiences through installation of additional covered or protected outdoor structures. I think during the COVID pandemic, that's one thing that's really come out is how important it is to have that access to um, the outdoors, but maybe have some covered access. And of course, we have the pavilion at Patriarch Park. We have a small pavilion at Harrison Meadows. What we're looking at at Emerson Park right now is also a, a pavilion space there for people to gather and to have. Um, we want to research and audit fee structures and scholarship opportunities to identify barriers to participation and opportunities for equity. We want to continue to explore public-private partnerships as a means for funding and collaboration. Uh, when I was at DBW, that was something that I was really proud of, is that we had a number of opportunities for funding that were really public-private par partnerships um, that worked out really well for us, and I would like to continue to explore that. Uh, we want to make sure that we're looking at the demographics of our users to determine if there are populations within our community that aren't participating for some reason and try to understand what that might be. Um, we want to provide outreach and develop programs and events more effectively, and we want to utilize our ARPA funds based on the community feedback to complete the deferred and emergent, emergent maintenance, maintenance um, needed for facilities. And then I also pulled out just a couple of the individual goals from some divisions just to talk about very quickly. Um, our guest services, we're gonna continue to expand at the Hanna Community Center and um, complete the third floor. And um, our, our staff is really interested in assessing the feasibility of making Hanna a community uh, true warming center for the community. And I think uh, Council Member Babcock had talked about that with some of the folks from the COE in making this, I think you discussed it as a resiliency center, um, which, is, which is a great phrase too. So that's something that we had already kind of put on our list as something to explore. Um, we wanna incorporate DEI in our community outreach and we are applying with the planning department for the MEDC RAP grant to improve and expand infrastructure for the farmer's market. School age childcare, we are looking at being accredited, going through the accreditation process, and we are continuing to seek grant funding for opportunities to expand services. Um, in, in recreation and arts, uh, we are really looking to diversify and expand recreational offerings by exploring new opportunities. Um, this is something that is became really clear in looking at the benchmarking that we do um, against the national standards is that we, we basically put our capital money towards upgrades and towards existing structures and facilities. Um, and then we look to some grant money for uh, extension of trails, but it's been a while since the city, almost nearly 20 years since the city's really looked at any kind of new asset. So whether it's a new playground, whether it's a new, new field of some kind or offering of some kind, and I think that that's something to explore and something that we should be looking at because that really is not in line with national benchmarking standards and what other communities are doing. We support others. We, um, you'll see in our budget that 
Uh, there's a $10,000 uh, transfer from our fund to the Alpha Respite Program and a facility that's provided to them. And Primetime Seniors also benefits from a, a fund transfer for, from us and dedicated space. We also collaborate with East Lansing Public Schools. Um, there are benefits to the school district for the soccer complex um, that they use with no fee for their high school soccer teams and then also their uh, rec uh, soccer leagues. Um, child care is another way that we collaborate and of course the middle school sports program. So here we are talking about budget and I don't think I've had a number on a page yet. <laughs> so we are to the to the actual revenues and expenditures by category. Um, our intergovernmental revenue is primarily grants. Our charges for services there are, um, are both the charges that we have for programming and services, but also um, we have, in addition, we have rental income uh, through the Hanna Community Center. We have community support, um, and then uh, we have our expenditures. Are there any questions? I can take a little pause if there's anything, or I'll keep going, because I have about 10 minutes. Council Member Brickover? So we're looking at page 91, which I think is what you're looking at right now. Um, so about 45% of your funding is um, from other financing sources, which for all intents and purposes is the city's general fund, is that correct? And so you're talking about the line for other financing yes. sources? Well, the mm -hmm. figure I'm seeing here yep. is $2,270,040. Okay. So the reality is at, at some level, these programs are self-sustaining other than this 45% contribution from the city's general fund, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Just a few questions. Yeah. Um, I was wondering for the star rating for the uh, Great Start or whatever it's called, have you guys done that before or is this the first time? First time, mm -hmm. just getting started. Okay, I think that's really good. Um, and what languages are you thinking about posting? So right now we're, um, we've, we've started uh, with Spanish for the art festival. Um, but we're really open to looking at lots of options. I think that, that it's really important. It's hard to know if you're talking about being inclusive, you kind of need to have quite a few options, I think. So I think it's something that we would <coughs> like to grow over time. Um, I know you guys do a lot of creative financing with grants and other stuff. Is that fall intergovernmental or is that in other finance sources that blended in there when you guys go out and find where you have intergovernmental revenue is that considered grant funding, grant funding? Mm -hmm. okay thank you i think wendy i'm sorry i, I wanted to make sure i was pro following proper protocol when we talk about um, doing signage in different languages one of the things we've also been looking at is QR codes that um, translate the signs into different languages um, for the user we're not sure if that would work better or actually just having you know multiple languages on the same signs so I just wanted to share we're looking at those two options right now thank you Wendy that's cool So a little deeper dive into revenues and expenditures by division is provided um, on the next page. And um, so one thing I'll point out, because when you look at these numbers, you might look at park stewardship, for example, and you might say the revenue at $2,000 and the expenditures 26,000 and some. If you understand that program, you'll know that that program has um, about 600 volunteers that the volunteer hours in terms of the equation into labor hours equates to about 15 to 17 thousand dollars worth of work that's done in our parks by those volunteers 
And so when you start looking at that program holistically and what actually is accomplished through that program, um, it gives you a little different perspective. So I just wanted to point that out. Happy to discuss any of these um, at length that you, that you would like. We can come back. <laughs> the fee schedule proposed for uh, 2023 has some adjustments. Um, the primary one that, that we want to bring to your attention is that we have eliminated, we're proposing to eliminate the resident, non resident fee for all youth programming. So um, when you're looking at the spreadsheets, that show fiscal year 22 and then fiscal year 23 proposed, you'll see a resident and non-resident column. Um, this applies to all of our uh, youth leagues, to uh, youth classes. Before and after school, the BNA program uh, did not have resident and non-resident um, status. It was only resident because they're students. But the summer camp um, did have a difference in fee. And so that's, um, that's changing as well. So that's just one fee for the summer camp, not a resident, non-resident. Um, and it's all going to just what the resident fee was. Um, same thing with, uh, you know, T-ball, uh, Little League baseball, basketball, all of those programs, uh, art classes, dance classes for youth, so all youth. Um, I will tell you that we looked at the impact to revenue for this. And I provide a, a couple of uh, slides a little bit later. If you want to maybe flip ahead a few slides to uh, one more, I think. No, one more. There we go. So here's a comparison of the impact on revenue for making this change in the proposed fee schedule. So you can see that when we look, and we're giving you 2019 numbers because that's pre-COVID. COVID numbers for Parks and Rec, you can imagine, are just very different and strange. <laughs> so we're going to go back to pre-COVID numbers. So if we look at our summer kids camp and we say, in 2019, the actual number of non-resident participants was 19. The number of days they participated was 50. Um, it was a dollar a day difference, so the impact per child was $50. The total impact in 2019, if we had not charged them the non-resident fee, would have been $950. For summer of 2022, we're already sold out for our summer kids camp. So we already know that we have 12 non-resident um, participants enrolled. Uh, who are participating for 45 days at $45 a child total, the total impact is $540. Again, this is one of those things that I, you know, to, to say we need a resident fee and a non-resident fee at such a small amount of revenue, um, for us, this, this seems like a, a, a good choice. Um, and we provided examples for, for Hannah Center community passes, um, the variety of passes that we we have also so you could see sort of the impact the impacts are not are not particularly large for making this change um, if we could go back again now there great so if there are any questions about that i'll move on to the other fees that we've changed just what page in the appendix All right, it starts on appendix a-11 for Parks and Rec. Thanks, Joe. Yep. So I'm just curious, do we have any non-resident adult members of sure. the Hannah Center? Yep. Can, so, do you have off the top of your head, or does your partner next, next city next to you off the top of her head? How many? How many have, and what, what they, they, they are charged to hire them out, correct? They are. Do we know what the differential is? In other words, how much extra do we bring in from those people? We can find out for you. 
because we would have to look into the system and see how many are, are non-residents and how many are paying the non-resident fee. And just out of curiosity in terms of your guys' experience, what do you know in terms of what I would uh, refer to as competitive um, resources in town like the MAC and the Ys and things like that? Are you able to obtain statistics as to what those rates are and what the revenues are at those, com at those competitors? We are. Okay. We are able to obtain that and we are quite competitive. Because frankly, I've always thought Hanna Center was the best deal in town and I just wonder if we should be marketing it better and if it, whether it makes economic sense to just conglomerate all the fees, so that's all. Go ahead, Wendy. Um, I just wanted to, to share, we can, as um, Kathy has indicated, we can get you additional detail, but generally 80% of our um, users here at the community center are residents. So um, at least that was the last time I looked at the numbers, it might be more like 75% now. So just thinking along those lines, it lets you know that the users here at the community center are, it's considerably, um, higher in the resident instead of the non-resident user. Right, well, so now you're going down that path. So what's the differential for a annual membership between a resident and a non-resident, you know? And we can get that for you. I actually okay. could look on the brochure, but um, it's actually in your fee, in your fee schedule. Well, I, okay. I can tell you. <laughs> I can tell you, yeah, it's in there. Um, so, an adult is it yep, I've got it. Per year. For an adult, 19 to I, I can't hear you guys, I'm sorry. Uh, page A12, adult annual pass for the community center is $300 for a non-resident and 235 for a resident, so $65 is the differential. Okay. Well, I, I would just query whether the same analytical equation applies to that subset of our um, users that applies to the subset of the kids. Absolutely. Were you done with your comments, Mr. Thank you, yes. Okay. And that kind of sparked two questions in my mind. Um, students at MSU who come in to use our facilities who wanted to buy a membership, would they, if they have a MSU card, do we count them as a resident even if they don't change their um, mailing address or do they have to have a... I think living here in East Lansing, we're counting them as an East Lansing so resident. So even if, even if their ID has a different mm -hmm. town on it, if they have a local, if they can prove a local residence, then they're a resident? Yes, they okay. can bring in a utility bill, they can bring in some other bill that has their name and their local address on it. And okay, that and then after suffice. that, it's a, they just check the card and they don't check their ID? Yes, okay. yep. Um, and then do we have capacity within our system to have more annual passes? Could we, mm -hmm. I mean, we, mm -hmm. do we have kind of a idea of how much capacity we have because mm -hmm. I, I agree with Mr. Brookover I was a resident or I was a member before I was a resident mm -hmm. it is definitely the best deal in yeah. town. Oh, it I'll is. Jump in on that to, to Brookover, your point. One of the reasons we're looking to use the third floor in that capacity is to greatly expand the size of the fitness area which is a little bit on the smaller side now compared to those competitors and this will make it I think it's two and a half times the size or tripling roughly three times, almost three times the size in terms of square footage, which will allow us to market it, you know, the great deal that it is, and also the fitness component and getting a lot more people into the facility. So a financial benefit, but also obviously a benefit of health and wellness for our residents, and of course non-resident participants too. So that's one of the key aspects of the third floor is the, is the much bigger span for the fitness center, the plan. So while we're going on that path, so let's say I'm disabled, let's say I'm in a wheelchair, and we do this expansion to upstairs, I mean, is there still going to be an exercise facility here on the first floor? That, that hasn't been entirely determined yet, but I believe that we have the ability to make this an accessible, an accessible space as well, and that's what we've uh, absolutely. Yeah. The third floor would be fully accessible. The elevator goes up to the third floor, um, and so that would be, you know, access up and down would be in through those, through that means. Okay. But how about the exercise rooms themselves? Um, the I, I've never seen anybody in a wheelchair in the exercise room. 
And it occurs to me, even if you're not large frame like the mayor and I, there isn't a lot of space between machines or to get around in there for a wheelchair or somebody who has uh, other kinds of disabilities that impair their movement. You're, you're absolutely right, and you're um, highlighting one of, the, um, one of the key features and reasons why we would want to expand up into the third floor. It gives us the opportunity to not only add more equipment and different types of equipment, but to um, widen the spaces between the equipment and um, provide for easier access. Right now, it is accessible in our fitness center, but everything is packed quite closely together. And and so, and that's to maximize the space and maximize the amount of equipment we can get in there. Where if we move to the third floor and we expand our space, then we have the ability to provide more space around the equipment as well to um, make that easier to access. And when we do that expansion, don't the various state handicapper sta uh, statutes then um, go into effect in terms of our overall accessibility in the building? so that they're in effect new standards when we do that construction? Um, I believe our building currently meets all of the, the standards for accessibility. We had an ADA um, assessment done a number of years ago and we correct and corrected any um, deficiencies or I think all of the deficiencies that we had or any of them. So yes, anything new would have to meet current standards. So I assume we're going to have that assessment before we start construction on the third floor, if in fact we approve such construction? So our architect would actually have to, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Magaki would have to come up with a plan that is fully handicap accessible for any of the parts before we begin construction. That would be part of his yes. engagement, correct? Yes, that's correct. And that's the process we go through for any of our um, any of our projects, whether it's a facility project or a park project. We talk about not just accessibility, but we talk about universal accessibility, and we talk about exceeding standards as much as possible. Yeah, I, I'm not questioning any of that, but what I'm concerned about is we have an old building, so I haven't studied it in detail. Maybe I should have, but so for instance, can a blind person use our elevator? Are there braille indications in the elevator? I believe Yes, so. there okay. are. And can a wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair, turn around in our elevator? Yes, I believe they can. Okay, is that, has the ADA looked at that? Do you know? Um, in terms of the ability to turn around in an elevator? Um, I in believe. In this elevator. In this elevator. Um, you need a five foot diameter, and yes, I believe that that was okay. included in the assessment. Thank you. Any other questions on the, yes. Um, I'm trying to match. Um, so for page 23 on the slide, it talks about the 2022 anticipated amount. Um, actually, I'm just gonna pause because I can't remember where I was going, but for 2023, you all are suggesting the same amount for summer kids camp for residents and non-residents. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Mayor <coughs> Bacon. Um, for the kids camps, is, are the capacities space driven, staffing driven, what creates the capacity and will the new expansion allow for additional capacity or changes yeah. moving forward? There is there is potential as we move the fitness center up to the third floor and, and we do some reconfigurate, reconfiguring of space. Um, we cannot do any of our licensed childcare on the third floor, but we certainly can in other spaces that, that may be um, not used on the first floor anymore. The other um, important thing to note about your question is that it's really driven by staffing levels right now and the challenges with staffing levels. And so we currently have enough staff for the number of campers that we've taken registration for. We do have a wait list and there still is time that if we were to 
um, be able to onboard more staff, then we could open up a few more slots. But we have state licensing limitations and ratios. Is that X amount per, is it five, four? I would have to multiples. pull up the the amount per child for camps. Um, it can come later. That yeah. was just curious. Yeah, we can find that out for yeah. you and let you know. Yeah. It's probably no surprise that I was picked last for every team, but I was. Me too. <laughs> That's why I love having you in charge of this. Um, I was a big fan of yours when you were the environmental staffer. But as I've listened to this, I, I'm frankly a little embarrassed that I didn't do the numbers during the previous two budget sessions that I've been on the council because a whopping total of $1,400 is a very, very small price to pay and it goes a very long way in equity. Um, one of the things I've long liked about, really, really for a long time liked about East Lansing's um, Parks and Rec back when it was East Lansing, Elra, whatever that was back in the 90s, is that it always offers things for a lot of different ages. And um, those of us who, you know, were picked last for every team, um, it's really some nice programming. Um, but I'm especially impressed this year by your mental health in initiative, um, taking the initiative on that, and the Narcan, and the DEI. I mean, just, just thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You can't do those kinds of things unless you have a really great team that's willing and sees the value in that. And I think that's what's really special about the group of people that we have. If there are any other questions about the fee schedule, I think I'll move us on to the CIP because I'm going long and I want us to be able to get through everything. So um, Parks Capital Fund. Our funding for our capital projects comes from grants, like the Natural Resources Trust Fund grant, um, the Michigan Council of Arts and Cultural, I don't have it right, I'm sorry. We call it Macaca, um, but it's close to that. Ingham County Trails and Parks Millage, we have uh, fundraising campaigns, we have council approved transfers from other funds like the general fund, and we have income tax fund that helps to um, get us through our projects. And I'm just gonna move right directly to the Northern Tier Trail pedestrian connections. Um, one thing about CIP funds, and I believe we talked about this a little bit also in our facilities discussion, is that these projects are not going to span a fiscal year um, start to finish. They're going to start in one fiscal year and they're going to go into another fiscal year and sometimes they go into a third fiscal year or even a fourth fiscal year. These can be, these can be projects that can last for a year, two years, sometimes two and a half years. Um, so you're gonna find that I'm talking about projects that you might say, well, I know they started that project two years ago or I think they finished that project this past summer, but we're still going to talk about it because we're always looking a little bit back in the CIP and looking forward as well. So the Northern Tier Trail um, pedestrian, pedestrian connections um, at Colorado Drive and Riveria Drive, this is such a great project. If you live in this area, I adore these bridges. Um, I know it's, it's really, um, they weren't built for me, but I have heard from so many residents who are really, really pleased about this project and um, just find it great in terms of its connectivity. Um, I provided you some, some pictures and construction on this is about 95% completed. Uh, this fall, we still have a final punch list to go through, some project repairs. We still have a ribbon cutting, wayfinding signage, and uh, some wetland remediation to wrap up. Um, there was allocation both in fiscal year 21 and 22 for this project, all through the Ingham County Trails and Parks Millage Fund. I know that you are aware of the Northern Tier Trail repair and relocation project because that came, the contract for starting this construction project came to you recently. Um, this project, uh, the contract was awarded April 19th at City Council and we're expecting to start this project in June. It'll run through September. 
Again, the allocation for this project is from the Ingham County Trails and Parks Millage Fund. Um, the Patriarch Park Sports Courts, we're looking at uh, 10 pickleball courts, a new basketball court to replace the existing basketball court, um, and some other amenities uh, in a tennis court and tennis practice wall for this, this project. Uh, this project is unique in that we have a pickleball group who has been doing fundraising. They're doing an excellent job of fundraising for this project. Um, we currently have uh, $100,000 from their fundraising efforts. We have $300,000 from the Natural Resources Trust Fund grant and $432,000 from the in income tax fund on this project. We opened bids on this project and uh, we only received one bid. So we have talked to those folks that we expected to get bids from to try to understand possibly why they didn't bid this project and we have heard back from some because that's concerning and we want to know when we only get one bid on a project, we wanna know what happened and why that is because we also wanna make sure that we're moving forward with a bid that is competitive. The bid also was higher than we expected. It was over a million dollars. And so we're in the process of doing value engineering on this project, and we're also in the process of trying to identify additional revenue for this project. Um, I don't know, Wendy, if you want to talk any more about that, or if there are any, if there are more questions about it, we can dive deeper into it. That pretty much covers it. Okay. The Northern Tier Trail Extension through White Park just had its ribbon cutting. Mayor Pro Tem Greg was there to speak. It was really a, a lovely ribbon cutting. And I bring this up because that project is connected to the Lake Lansing Road pedestrian safety improvements that were initially um, proposed along with this project. While this project has wrapped up, it's taken us a little bit of time to get all the approvals and the design approved for the uh, pedestrian safety improvements, but we are pretty much there with this project now, and we actually um, have a status and a, and a timeline that we've provided. Uh, the project cost is $400,000 from the Ingham County Parks and Trails Millage and $600,000 from the Federal Transportation Safety Funds um, that Ingham County Road Department secured uh, some federal funds for that. Emerson Park improvements, I mentioned Emerson Park earlier. This is a park that has not seen any improvements in many, many years, and so we started some uh, some replacement of play equipment back when I was um, still at DPW and then we're, we're rolling forward with this with some uh, 2022 CDBG funding. Um, and we're still in the process of uh, narrowing the scope of this project and really um, looking at what we can do with the funding we have available. We had really good feedback from the community on this project. We did a community survey in the area and people were really excited about the fact that this park is getting some attention. The aquatic center improvements, I know the mayor was out um, and got to see the aquatic center while it was in its, uh, still in its construction phase. And so these before and after pictures are pretty dramatic. There's still, there's still work to do. They have started installing the liner, um, but you can imagine that's a big, big pool space. And so it's gonna take a little bit of time here. Um, there are some cement repairs uh, that are progressing as well, but we, we are expecting a delayed opening as a result of uh, delays with the construction and with hiring challenges as well. Um, this project cost in fiscal year 21 was around 15,000 um, and another just over 400,000 allocated through the income tax fund in fiscal year 22. Um, also, a uh, project that was in our CIP was the uh, Dr. Robert L. Green historical marker. The marker that you see in the picture is the temporary marker. We do have possession now of the permanent marker, so that will be installed. And then this will be a project that we imagine is going to develop over time. We have some sketches. If you were at the, um, the program that day, we had a big poster up of sketches for an observation deck and some other ideas that that we have related to this project once we're able to um, identify some funding for that. 
The Bailey Park Outdoor Fitness Equipment Project is um, the result of a family that donated uh, money for this specific project, wanted fitness equipment in the Bailey Park in honor of their son who had passed away. This is a um, project that we're hoping to get installed um, yet this year, and uh, we're, still, we're still working through that process. The Patriarch Park Pavilion and restroom renovation, we have our ribbon cutting on Monday, and this has been really great. I don't know if you've seen um, that we have a solar panel out there. We actually had to do a lot of work to uh, tie all the meters at the park to that solar panel through Board of Water and Light. It's not something that they usually um, will do, but we, we persisted and we managed to get all the meters tied to that solar panel and we've got that almost up and running, so we're pretty excited about that. If you haven't seen the new pavilion or the new bathrooms, I highly recommend checking it out. It's, it's really great. The very last thing I provided you um, in terms of the CIP is that I think this is really helpful from a historical perspective to see um, funding from the Ingham County Parks and Trails millage that we have received since 2016 by project and then funding from the Natural Resources Trust Fund that we've received by project. Um, and some of that goes back to, all the way back to 1995. But I thought that would be helpful to see it all historically laid out. Um, it's a pretty substantial amount of money that has gone towards projects in the city. All of which I believe were probably managed and uh, implemented by Wendy Wilmers Longpree, our assistant director who is amazing at those projects. Aquatic pool is going to open, Aquatic Center? So initially we had really um, hoped for a June 4th opening and now we're hoping for a beginning of July opening. Okay. If it can be sooner, we'll make it happen sooner. We are training our staff, we're proceeding so that if we're ready we can, we can go ahead and open. Um, but we just still have some concerns in terms of finishing up the, the construction there and the timeline that it's taking. Um, and of course, construction companies are struggling right now too, and supply chain is struggling, and so yeah. it's um, it's difficult all around. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Remaining item four point two. I think this is just the written communication of questions asked by. And at this point, obviously, that's the end of our presentation. So if council has any specific questions or wants to make any changes, um, certainly now would be a good time for it. I, I have another, another, uh, a number of questions, which I think probably the city manager can probably just answer tonight, if that's OK with the mayor. I certainly um, will try. Which might lead to my asking for some changes in the resolution <laughs> but and I'm referring now to the original book we got a section entitled budget in brief <clears throat> and beginning and and if it's easier just to do this in writing between now and the next meeting maybe that's the most efficient way to do it um, so I'll leave that to you George sure. okay let me know what so um, my first question is at the bottom of page four I'm sorry page 15 Ms. Watts and I are getting jammed up on those Roman numerals. Um, you say there are additional dollars at the federal and state level that may become available to the city over the coming years, yada, 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 yada. Are, is there any more indication now before we vote on this budget in late May that there are additional dollars? At this point, I have not had, I mean, we're still waiting on uh, conversations on pension funding potentially. But at this point, I don't think we have any. Um, we have child care funding, but I don't think there's anything additional at this point. Jill, do you have any more up-to-date information? Yeah, I don't know of anything else that's not already in the budget. Obviously, there's the Jobs Act um, that was out there, but it looks like less and less. It looks less and less like we will um, receive any of that money. Um, and then, as George mentioned, you know, the state is still considering uh, helping the pension, so. Perhaps that's still a possibility. 
Um, I believe the governor and the House both included it in their budget, but the Senate did not. Or maybe I have the House and the Senate backwards, but um, I haven't heard anything recently on that. Um, okay. But I can't think of anything else. Okay, thank you. And referring to the next page, which is 16, um, I have two questions from that. And, and the first one is, so in the third full paragraph, you talk about several assumptions are used in preparing the annual budget. And you go on from there and you explain the personnel costs are one of the largest pieces of the budget. And so uh, three or four sentences down, you say, for amounts related to wages, a 3% cost of living adjustment increase and a 5% step increase where applicable have been used. So I assume the step increase applies to uh, organized employees? So any employees who are still within steps that haven't topped out, that could be non-union people that are moving within steps or organized employees as part of a bargaining unit. If someone has topped out, they would not be eligible for that, but depending on where they are in their salary range, typically it's 5%. Okay, you mean between steps? Correct. Okay, so you're just assuming a certain number of people are gonna increase steps. That's a part of the whole personnel budget that they build in December is, okay. is what people are within what right. steps and where are they moving to. Right, so then, and maybe it's in here in one of these graphs or charts, but I didn't see it. Can you, can you before next week, give us the specific um, figures? It looked like there's a gross figure included in the charts but I didn't see a breakdown by, for instance, by union groups or different employee groups. Is that, can we do that? Now you mean uh, like in aggregate for employees, what, it will be, what the payroll is now and what the payroll will be after July 1, or do you want to know by specific bargaining unit? How do you want to see that? All of those things. Okay. And you're talking in aggregate by group, but not individuals. You want- Yeah, 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 groupings. yeah, by group, please. All right. Yeah. And then, um, on that same page down at the bottom, um, and maybe you just answered this, I, you might have, but so you say additional assumption changes have been forecasted by MERS with additional reductions to the investment rate of return expected with the December 2021 valuation impacting fiscal year 2024 required contribution amounts. I'm assuming we don't yet have that evaluation after the December end of the year situation? Correct. Correct. The valuation from December is usually received in June of the All following right, so year. It'll be so it'll be next month. Next month. So it'll be just after we approve the budget. Yes. Okay. Um, and then on the next page, 17, um, under the general fund, you say the general fund budget is $42 million, et cetera, et cetera. First paragraph. This increase of 6.6% is primarily due to changes in staffing, the cost of living adjustment of 3.0%, increasing pension costs, and ARPA-funded projects that will be housed in this fund. Is there some chart that shows the breakdown by category in those things? So for instance, if I wanted to know, well, how much are the ARPA-funded projects going to affect that increase? Where would I go to find that? I think we can break that out for you. I, that, I would appreciate that. Um, and then um, the fourth paragraph down under that general fund, the city continues to commit funds and hopes to reduce the unfunded pension liability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the one request I would have in terms of preparing the discussion for next week is I would like to see what our budget would, what, what your suggestions would be if we added another million dollars to the, what I'm gonna call the payback on the unfunded liability. And, and where would you recommend those changes being made in terms of what budget items? So at this point, you're asking if you want to increase the general fund contribution an extra million dollars. And at this point, the easy answer is we'd take it from fund balance, but that would, that might overly burden our, or reduce our fund balance, but we can have that number for you. Okay. In other words, that would, you would recommend that as opposed to cutting any of these programs? It would be, um, if we wanted a long-term look at how I would do that differently, 
I could take a long-term look and do a reduction in departments, and that would be something that would be a much more challenging plan to implement because it would result in service delivery reductions and staff reductions. So if we were to do something like that and we wanted to get there, I could do it over time and make a recommendation. But if we were to do it now and you were to ask me, I would say it would have to come from fund balance unless we were to do reductions in voluntary layoffs and that sort of thing, which certainly I wouldn't want to recommend. Right. I, I understand. I, I, I would like to see what, what that would look like with a reduction in the fund balance. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you. Great. So, I, may, I might have a few questions, but I have some um, amendment suggestions. So how do I go about it? So uh, I think what you asked today was a question of our CDBG staff, and you asked for how we could allocate differently, including, is it Eve? Actually, or is it safe I place? have. There's no safe place. My numbers are a little bit different okay. right now. But um, I'm, do I make a motion or do I just talk to council about an idea of an amendment or how do I propose it right I now? I think you could do it as a motion now and then we could include it if, if there's agreement from everybody. So you could say what, start from a chart that is closest to what you want that we have and we will make the notes and then we can make sure next week that we have it updated. I think if it's within CDBG, it will not change the overall resolution but correct because the resolution does not go to that level of detail about human services right correct so it won't change the overall resolution but obviously we will have to administer it the, we will administer it the way it's directed by council mayor can i just make a procedural suggestion absolutely i i find it hard to vote on a motion without having the documentation in front of me and so what i might suggest here is if Council Member Watson could identify what she would propose to be the motion next week, yep. and so that the staff can put that in a, you know, in some sort of format, so then we can review it before we vote on the motion. Because I'm inclined to agree with her on some of those things, but yeah. I need more detail than we have tonight. Yeah. We certainly could do that. We could start if it's a starting point of the one that we provided. Yeah. You can tell us what numbers to change, and we can have that as a draft motion. Uh, for next week. Yeah, I, that sounds good to me. I, I wouldn't mind um, verbally talking about some things now and then seeing it in writing for you all yeah. um, the next time. And so um, earlier today, I did ask for regarding the CDBG funds and to the social service groups. I will not be talking today about the sidewalks or CAP funds. Um, this has to do with the social service groups that were funded or not funded. Um, and again, uh, going back to the paper that showed um, the amount of dollars social service agencies had gotten I, in the past, I was surprised that MSU Safe Place was left completely off of funding when we've funded them um, as a city um, repeatedly. And so my proposition wanted to um, make space for MSU Safe Place to get some dollars. I think it's great that they're around. I think um, being a college city that it's important that they're around. And I think when we decide or don't decide to put our dollars towards something, it says something about us. And so um, again, my goal was to make space for MSU Safe Place, um, who had originally asked for $10,000. And so this is what I am proposing, um, so we can uh, get it in writing next time um, for council to consider. Um, for the Cole Parks and Rec Youth Scholarship um, to remain funded at the recommended, recommended whatever, amount, this is gonna be a long day, <laughs> of $5,000. Um, for Eve's place to remain at the recommended amount of $10,000, for Haven House to um, be at 41,500 plus 980. 
um, for MSU Safe Place to receive 8,300. For Tri-County Office on Aging to receive 8,300 plus 915. And I believe that that is the full $75,000. Um, and I mean, you all sent me a nice layout earlier today. So council, will, you all will see that layout that includes the advisory group's recommendations, that includes how much um, each agency requested, and then you can see um, where it was that my numbers came from in case um, it's something you'd like to consider. And we can just do it where we add a column to what's there so people can see what's from the original recommendation to what you're proposing, and then we can have it very clear for council to take action. Yeah. I don't. There are some things that I'd like to discuss, but I'm not ready to put them into a coherent request at this time or where they'd be in the budget. Um, I, th I think I'd better type and send. And thankfully, Council Member Brookover will be able to look at them next week. I do, I do have a few more questions when everybody else is exhausted. <laughs> I'll come back. I'll come back to you. I think that my primary requests were around um, looking at the long-term budget around uh, DE&I, um, particularly in lieu. We're not living in a vacuum here. Uh, looking at their budget and kind of the things that are going on, I'm pres I'm presumptively assuming we're going to, particularly on the community side, we're going to need uh, more outreach and more things around this. Um, I think this budget was primarily looking at from kind of reading through it. Um, the internal training and the work we did, and we did make a really huge primary investment in that. Um, but kind of the same thing, I <clears throat> to look at any of the departments in their infancy and kind of talking to Adam and people like that, I think they need longer runways and, and, and other things, and they had the exact same issues kind of coming into the downtown thing when they were just coming up on things too late with that. I was, I was looking for a longer term strategy for that and definitely some kind of budget increases. I threw out some radical things, but since uh, Director Hardy's not here to represent that, I'd look for something um, maybe not as radical as what I want to do at this point. But I do want to see more um, activity around this, in, in, including how we're going to export some of the work that we've done uh, into the community around DEI and I as a, as a numerical thing, along with some benchmarking and some other stuff around that ties into um, both looking at staffing and all kind of all those kinds of things and if like um director DeShambo said if it rolls over i'm looking say it's july 1 we're starting if it's june if it's rolling and that's what we got to do with it to fit some of these things under the under the when we're going to get them done that's kind of what we got to do but i, I don't want to take our foot up off of the gas here on this and allow this effort to die death of a thousand budget cuts as we get into tighter times here i want to kind of basically benchmark what this is going to be going to have because that's kind of what happens with all the other departments at this point I, I feel like a lot of their stuff set in stone and then we're moving around the last million bucks or whatever and whatever's left for i don't know less priority um initiatives and that kind of thing so i, I think we gotta kind of start try to start setting some water a water line here for this department so it lasts beyond and beyond really me and anyone else um, who has interest in diversity um, and my primary thing is as we start to try to export this is on the side of culture and just conversations that we've had and um, particularly being around the downtown and being around the people around with Adam's team and that kind of thing and just people I think the perception is we have a lot of things with culture but do we actually celebrate it or are we kind of shot not haven't done the work where we're able to comfortably celebrate culture in a real way like what's the culture of of East Lansing and I think that there's something there there and I can't quite put my finger on it um, that's like the missing link that's there's something 
there, and I think it's it's economic. I think it's a lot of things if we could tap into this into this piece. So, just a couple of thoughts for you, Mayor. So, yeah. one thing is this budget does have a seventy-five thousand dollar yet to be allocated contractual services so that to be identified. So that could be for internal training, could could be for outreach or for community engagement events. We also could think about. There's been discussion in the past about a cultural. Um, event that celebrates different cultures and that could also be something that's run in conjunction with Parks and Recreation because we have um, some excellent staff as, as Kathy mentioned, Car Carla Forrest Stewart who could do something in terms of um, parks activities, in terms of connections with um, downtown events. So there could be some sort of a signature cultural event that we could look at as well if council wants to look at that. So I think there's lots of different things we can do. In terms of funding beyond the 75,000, there's a couple of options. One could be that there's ARPA dollars available that could be for perfect for one time if you want to do broad scale community engagement type events, like community conversations, bring in a speaker, that type of thing, and also certainly budget amendments. If at this point you'd be using fund balance, you could do it now or identify it later, and we could do a budget amendment and simply move the money that we have as well. Um, so there are options for that, and I think that there's a, a couple of things that intersect with parks and recreation, as we mentioned a cultural event that's a celebration of, of culture. I know that that was something that was discussed by a number of different council members in different fashions. Um, so those are a couple of areas we could certainly look at. Since uh, Director Hardy's on that side of the room, I don't want to put her on the spot again, which I do all the time with stuff. But yeah, I, I sent out kind of some ideas or things that I'd want to look at funding for and then can we look at that along with how to collaborate and coordinate. There's a lot built into Parks and Rec and those kinds of things, but I want to see, like I said, um, where we start to set a water line here for, for D&I as well, where it's not just this up and down <laughs> fluctuating whatever's left of, of the budget after everyone's, because everyone else's stuff seems pretty set in stone. And I can see, we kind of see what's on the horizon here. We have to set a watermark and, and define D&I as, as an important, real, thing, which is really hard to define, and culture is really hard to define, but I know there's something there that we need to continue to work on. Just while you're talking about DEI and funding, Mr. Mayor, have you thought about consolidating the DEI funding? For instance, there's a piece of it in police and moving that back to the DEI department. That was something I had contemplated. Is that when, something when, you're interested in, or is when you're typing, look at it. Yeah. <laughs> Handed it back to me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they're all general fund dollars, so in some way that it doesn't it doesn't necessarily matter where it sits because it's general fund. So if we have the training budget for police and fire are probably two of our bigger frontline departments that have training budgets on a wide variety of areas, um, but certainly the DEI budget of seventy five thousand is probably our largest single piece of training dollars probably in the organization, right? So it is a it is an extremely significant allocation in that area. This year, I think that the original contract for Truth and Titus, um, was it $125,000? And that was training the entire all city staff over um, a year period. No, nope. and I, I get it from that yeah. perspective, but if I'm yeah. looking, if I'm drilling down it through it and we're going, um, as far as providing support to MSU, neighborhoods, community, festivals, observations, celebrations, um, things along that line, I think that was, um, I mean, the training portion was really our, that's like roads. That was yeah. the stuff that we hadn't done, you know, for the whole existence of our government, a full, a full blown cultural realignment. I can't, you know, that's just like, that's just to get it. That's just the roads. Now we got to put yep. the sidewalks and all the other stuff in. In my opinion, I don't. I just don't think we've done it. Um, and I think the community is going to hold us accountable for this. I think this is going to come up. This is gonna, what. What have we done? And we're going to say we did our cultural alignment. What have you done to export this? Or what are you doing? What's East Lansing? That's coming up. So I'm trying. I'm trying to head it off. Yep. We can certainly <laughs> have more conversations and yeah. come back with something. Yeah. So I'll just. Uh, send it back to the director to come with something. And I, same thing I kind of said to, to Adam, just something, show us a path forward. It's a new department, like some extended numbers and what we do over multiple years so we can have an understanding of what yep. that expectation will be. That way it's not sneaking up on anyone, but 
Is that feasible? Certainly. Maybe a ballpark number so you don't see fluctuations from year to year. Um, I'm not sure like spending a half a million dollars one year and spending a hundred thousand the next year is the right approach from a financial perspective or a budgeting perspective yeah, that's fair. or even a getting the work done perspective. Um, you know, so it feels to me like maybe it's more of like, let's determine a plan and figure out right. Like you're saying the next three to five years, how do we implement that plan? Um, because I don't think it's something you can do overnight and not that it's not important to move forward quickly. Um, but I would say too, like a lot of departments are doing things, right? You just heard like the Parks and Recreation, how they're approaching it. So I don't think it's all like housed in the DEI division of the general fund. So there are costs spread out, just not as obvious mm -hmm. um, that are associated with those efforts. Any other questions or comments? Just with reference to your comments, Mayor, I, you know, I've always looked at this as a multicultural uh, community, but it just seems to me that as we go down that path together, we should always think about including the resources at Michigan State University and the schools, both of which may also have some funding that can be useful to all of us in this multicultural endeavor. Uh, my other questions were with regard to the revenue side of things, and um, I'm just curious as to whether we have up, updated data. Um, so on page uh, 58, you're talking about the revenue stream, and uh, in the middle of the page, we're talking about property taxes remain the single largest source of revenue. Uh, do we have any updated figures? I mean, I realize that those tax bills don't go out for, again, another month or so, or six weeks, eight weeks, but do we have any idea as to whether your projection uh, may be uh, on the low side on that in terms of the property taxes? Historically, our estimates for property taxes are pretty accurate. Um, I'm sure they are. I, I, I didn't question you for a minute. <laughs> because we utilize um, values as of March, so we are we really are of March this of, March. Yeah. This March. Okay. So okay. It, they're pretty accurate. Of course, there could be board of review adjustments, STC, MTT, State Tax Commission, Michigan Tax Tribunal. Yeah adjustments, um, but those are generally immaterial. Uh, we do allow for some when we do the budget, but we're not overly conservative. We really use estimates as of March. Um, sure. So historically, we've been pretty close. And a corollary of that is, and I think somebody else may have asked this sometime in the last five or six weeks, collections-wise, I mean, are we have we been in pretty good shape collections-wise even through the pandemic? For property taxes? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. And then my last question, Mayor, is on the next page with talking about the income tax fund. And again, you're making an estimate of fiscal year 22 uh, projection. Do we have any more recent data that would change that projection one way or the other? I'm actually in the process of reviewing the income tax fund. Um, still not going to be great <laughs> projections, but I can update them. Because I paid my taxes, <laughs> and I'm just curious. As to the timeline, so if uh, people filed timely, so that by May 2nd, refunds have to be out by June 15th. So June 15th is really when we will know, because that's when processing has to be completed. So like two weeks after we passed the Yeah, <laughs> again, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I can definitely do another update, see where we're coming in to date. I just, it's hard for me to guess at what's going to happen over the next month as far as processing. No, just curiosity, that's all. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> oh, you're right. Yeah. Um, so the, my questions now are going into the appendix. And um, the first one is uh, Appendix A-3. Um, this is under fire, and this is the new red additions, the ambulance response treatment and the um, inter-intra-facility hospital. 
And you'll typically see a pattern with some of my questions, and that is um, huger increases than what I see on other line items. And so is that like something that the consumer would get charged to bill to their insurance maybe? My Chief understanding, is Chief is here, but my understanding is our medical billing company um, does a study and determines like what insurance normally pays. And so um, we can kind of maximize the insurance um, coverage and not have additional billings to the patient. But Chief, please step in if you have other things to add. I've been talking to the attorney. That number is going to come down more into what Medicaid allows for. But it was a, a diversion from some hospitals wanting to use the, us as their transport, yeah. which we would not be able to do. So um, when the budget comes out for our vote next time, is the change going to be on there? Yes, ma'am. OK. All right. Thank you. Um, my next question is on Appendix um, A-6. I was curious for the um, under inspection fees, housing licensing, the complaints, um, the fees have stayed the same. And I was just curious about why that was. I don't really have a lot of great context to, to give you on that. I can certainly talk to uh, Ms. Irwin and, and we can try to provide that context prior to next week. Sure, and, and, um, and similarly with the licensing fees, um, again, it, it's like some groups are being asked to pay more money and then other, I, I don't know, not so much, um, like no increases at all. So again, um, same with the lic licensing fees. Um, I'm curious about how, why those fees have stayed the same um, and weren't one of the ones that were increased. I think the only thing I can say at the moment is that we, we try to keep our fees such so that they cover the costs related to the, those particular activities, but I can certainly ask Ms. Irwin to provide some additional context for you. Next is um, Appendix um, A-8, and this is the electrical fees. Um, the permit fee went from 2% of permit fee to 40% of permit fee, and I was curious about that increase. memory is failing me, but I believe that um, there, was, there was sort of a recasting of how that fee would be allocated. But to get you the specifics on that, I'm going to want to talk to Mr. Weaver and get some, we'll get some answers to you in writing yep. to explain that. Because it's, it's been a while since we, we were uh, talking about that. Um, and you said talk to who? Uh, Scott Weaver is our okay, building great. official. Okay. And I don't know if this is you again, but... Um, Appendix, uh, the next page, A-9, the testing per hours that are added, um, where are those coming from? Like, what does that mean? I'm sorry, I, I testing. Okay. So testing per hour, it's in red, and it wasn't, um, it appears that it was never a fee. I think it's an electrical. It's, an electrical. it's electrical. So electrical unit fee inspection, testing per hour, other inspections didn't exist before and now it's $70. Is that related to life safety to um, alarm inspections before building all these?
Yeah, so I, I think, again, I'm, I'm not, I don't have this uh, information at top of mind, but I can certainly get you the information. And, and my, as I recall, I think that there is, again, a, like a recasting of how these fees work, mm -hmm. and I can provide some, some of that context for you. Um, it does. It does look significant, but I think there's there's some uh, there's some context that we can bring that actually will uh, help explain this. Thanks. Um, next is A12. So for fiscal year 2022, like for the Family Aquatic Center, we never executed those prices, right? Because we weren't open. Great. We I will be recommending, and let me know if I need to put this in writing or if you all will, um, George, but um, I will be recommending that we stay for fiscal year 2022 at the non-resident fee and not increase that non-resident fee for the 2023 budget. So are you saying not change the non-resident piece but change the resident? So the resident would change, but not the non-resident? Um, it was the non-resident, but. The annual pass, or for which daily yep. annual? For the, so I'm on the daily passes. Okay. Um, that whole section, I'm gonna be recommending that it remain the same for non-residents as it was fiscal year 2022. So basically all go up a dollar. So you're suggesting that uh, non-residents don't increase the dollar. But the resident the resident fee will still increase a dollar then? Right. I am okay. not um, I yeah. You're correct. Just off the top of your heads, anybody know what the net differential is there? Uh, what I can tell you is that non resident fees make up uh, about eighty percent of the revenue collected um, for admission from two thousand nineteen. We can calculate it, though. The net effect, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I will be um, recommending, I will be submitting something, a different suggestion for the non-resident fee for 2023 for um, the 10-day passes, the, um, the one that's 145 and the one that's 95. Uh, it seems kind of steep, um, the difference. And again, if we're looking at 2019 numbers and we never executed 2022 numbers, and it's just still a hard time for people and their money and their pockets, I um, will be recommending a lower amount for the non-residents. Well, just to clarify, the, the rates, in fact, have not changed since 2019, correct? I mean, didn't the rates stay all the so, – so when Council Member Watson's talking about effectuating the fiscal year 2022 rate, that actually is the same rate as it was in 2019, correct? Well, there was a change showing up on here in fiscal year 21 that obviously didn't take place because the aquatic center was not open. Yeah. Only for 10 visit season passes and group rates. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still on the daily pass is what I was looking yeah, for. Yeah, for daily okay. passes, correct. Nothing has changed since 2019. Because if it's not colored, then there's no change. Yeah. Red is an increase, blue is a decrease. I can only work in whole numbers, uh, Director DeChambeau, with the new start date, if I'm calculating correctly, I mean, we, you're down in the aquatic center, that's either one-fourth or one-sixth, depending on when you close of total revenue, or if, if it has, I don't know how to look at it between now and next year. You've lost your first month of activity, correct? Of, so there's, you're down to start, is that reflected in well, keep in mind that that first month of activity is actually in fiscal year 22. That's right, okay. That is budgeted in fiscal year 22. So we'll have so to look at what the impact that is because the 
budget for fiscal year 22 would have been based on on the fees that were set. So you a permit for a season the season has just gotten shorter we're ta yeah we did yeah. talk about um, finding some way of crediting or, or absolutely okay. yeah. yeah because yeah. I'm sorry paying, I misunderstood what no you're I was asking. just trying to yeah yep. basically yep. instead of three months they're paying for two months and we've Correct. got to try to give them some credit back yes. if they purchased an annual pass a proration or to extent. make it exactly to make it fair otherwise they pay too much yes. okay that's what I was absolutely looking at. Yes, yeah. we're looking at that yeah okay. we're already looking at that and Kathy can you remind me because I feel like I've had a conversation before that when we say it's for fiscal year 23, is that the 23 summer season or the 22 summer season? No, I believe we expected that these fees would go into effect for the 22 season once approved. Okay. Mm -hmm. So am I looking at it correct though that your additional month is actually on the back half of next, the start of next mm -hmm. summer is your other month? Correct, was yeah. budgeted for. Yes. Yeah. So I just had two more to go, but um, other ones I think I might email some of those questions. But um, A-17, and this is primetime senior funds, and this is the adaptive yoga. It's such a huge increase. And again, I just think it's a tough time for folks. So. Why was that picked to increase by so much? I think we'll have to follow up with uh, the director of the yeah, seniors Lyman. program. She'd set those rates and, and uh, adaptive yoga. And the last one is um, A-21, and this is under the parking fund. What is a, a pay later notice this fee for a pay later notice? I believe a pay later notice is if they lose their ticket. So if you go in and you've lost your ticket and you go to exit or you say you have no ticket, um, that would be the fee assessed because you wouldn't know how long they had been in there. I thought it was me. When you buy a moped like 12 years ago and think you can park free any place in East Lansing and even on campus at one point in time and then later they do this what did you just call it? The pay later thing. So now I got to pay later. That's that's the deal. Actually, isn't the pay later when I you? I thought the pay later is when you leave the ramp when you're at the ramp at night and the, the gates have open. When you don't have. Yes, it's not an attendant. I think because the, the lost ticket is the one above that one. So I right. think you're right. It's it's actually when you're, the ramp is no longer. Does that even apply at this point? Because we don't have gated. We don't we have um, we don't staffed. Have, we don't have staffed boots anymore. Uh, you're right. I had confused in the, the about this before. We'll check on that one as well. I can't, I can't remember the right. difference it's, between a lost it's ticket. The pay later and used to be like an, almost like a ticket that you'd get on your window right. if the ramp closed at two. But they don't do that anymore because they, they don't, don't do open the anymore, gates. So I will check on that to see why that's like that. Why the thirty dollars is there? Yep. Okay. Trust me. I think I, over the years I've learned every variation of traffic of parking ticket in East Lansing. Yep. We'll figure it out. <laughs> just comment to make um, first I just want to say thank you everyone for your time um, it is hard to work during the day and then come here at five and then you know seem feels like stay here forever um, I was wondering if maybe next time we get the appendix uh, whatever the appendix is if um, the propose, if you could um, flip it so the 2023 budget is the first thing that I see and then, you know, the 2022 and 2021 so that I don't have to go from the far end all the way over to this end, but that I can just kind of see it right there and then go from there to see what's happened in the past just for my, you know, vision. I'll make that note. <laughs> and it also is kind of hard to track it. You yeah, I had to use like a ruler and then I, I lose my place. A heavily, yeah. Uh, yeah, like every fifth line being heavy would help to fix that. So you can put that for next year when you put that together. Well, I think the other question is, is five years helpful? This started a few years back that we did a five-year look. We used to only give a two-year look, right, current and next year. Um, but five years seemed to be 
helpful for the council at that time. So if that's still helpful, we will can they will continue that. I think we're going to need that just because we had two years that were extremely disrupted, and so we might even need more than that looking back for a little while just to give context to some of these numbers. But five is great yeah. Good. for now. Okay. I'm sure my team back there has noted. <laughs> That's all. As we said over and over again, now we got to prove it, that budgets reflect values. So, um, and I value the community and all the all the work of everyone in this room that they put into this process and anything we sent back or put back in writing send it in for any changes or anything you want done prior to next time and then obviously um, yeah let's get it, let's keep it going congratulations on getting to this point it's very difficult so thank you guys May I ask a quick procedural question of what you would like to see next week so we gave you a draft resolution would you like us to update that draft resolution with all of your guys's suggestions with notes? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to present this next week because normally what we would do is say, here's the draft resolution with all of these changes included in it um, from the preliminary to you know, what has been discussed. Or we can give you the draft resolution as the budget sits today and then have a bunch of motions and what that impact would be to the resolution. What if you did a draft budget, used your current budget, and then added red lines in terms of the various suggestions you've sort of heard tonight and you may hear in the next week? So essentially we have one document and we're going down with the red lining that would be included if there were changes or modifications based on council members discussions and maybe even if you can go so far as to footnote those so that it you know per per council person Watson per mayor Bacon etc cetera, etc cetera. because then it seems to me we can just go through that and exclude or include what we want to what we want to do okay we can I mean subject to the city attorney but it just seems to me that's probably the most clearest and concise way of doing it plus it helps us you know, maybe it helps me to figure out you know who's making what motions and what people want to change or not change so then I think the way it would work is fellow council people is that we would have that in front of us and then you could make a motion to modify that according to red line one so if Ms. Watson wanted to do this and such, it would already be there and we could include that if we need, if we want to via motion. It's at least one suggestion. We can try that, yes. I'm, I'm only a little nervous because I'm sure there's going to be some lines that are going to have multiple changes to them, but we can add multiple footnotes. Yeah. We just number them with, you know, numbers. Okay, thank you. All right, if nothing further, I'll say meeting adjourned. Likely based on this time where we're sitting right now, probably looking more at like 10 after.